only one Jesus. It's May 7th. I'm getting ready to record in like a month-ish. I think we're doing guitars in like two or three weeks. And yeah, so I've just been practicing a lot. I've got like three songs down. Started the fourth one yesterday. It's my fucking sheet music. Sick. These are my drums. I put my nice cymbals on for you. I normally practice with these. This is where I warm up. My crazy pads. Alex Rudinger set up inspired. Yeah, I just do like a warm up every day over here. That's the f drum head from my first ever drum kit right there. That's pretty cool. First ever drum stick, believe it or not. Not everybody can say they have that. I do have this laminate from the second ever Seder DIY tour. It's a Seder show we did in Texas, our first time in Texas. Last tour I did before COVID, pretty much as late as you could do a tour, I guess, in February 2020. With COVID and everything, I think that we uh, we definitely had more time than we would have had to write. And I don't think staying at home separately, you know, not together, really affected much because really the way that we write, at least for all of Locus and for all of this album, it's just me and Soup sending each other demos. <laughs> my little office, studio, whatever space. I spend pretty much 95% of my waking hours in here. I run the merch store and everything out of uh, this part of the room right here. This is all the vinyl. Shout out to everyone who pre-ordered a vinyl, by the way. If you ever buy anything from staterACL.com, it's all right here and I personally package everything. So these are my guitars. I got a Kiesel, uh, Kiesel Aries uh, Model 6, I think. We're going to be using it for most of the Drop C stuff on the album. And then this is my Fender Telly that I've had for a while. I wrote pretty much the entire album on this guitar. Uh, and this is JD's Telly that I have. Uh, I just got all of our guitars set up um, for the album because I'm starting tracking about two weeks from now. And this is a chicken suit that my good friend Jacob bought me. He, uh, he actually did the album art for Neutrino. Uh, way back in the day. But yeah, we, we used it for a couple videos. I might bust it out at a show one day or something, I don't know. But for now, it's hanging up here. This is my workstation, my big ass Mac computer. Uh, this is my Kemper profiler that I use to record all our demos. Um, Corey has the same Kemper at his studio that we used uh, to do all the tones and stuff for Locus. And I just fucking loved it. This thing is awesome because it has any any tone, any amp sound, any effect you could want. It's just all in this one box. I'm gonna use it live. I use it to record demos. I'll never have to buy another amp again. Super stoked about that. But yeah, this is uh, this is where I do all my shit. This is where I do all my work, all the writing, all the editing. Basically, the entirety of this album it was written uh, over email on guitar profiles with me and Brody just communicating back and forth. Soup, at the start of this process, basically after Locus was done, he just started writing a bunch of demos. Some of them are more developed than others. Some are just, you know, core ideas that aren't very developed. Because right now the song names are just numbers, and I think we're at like 29 total. It's just a random list of numbers that aren't really linear at all. But basically I'll go through the list and kind of pick the songs, and then he would like rewrite whatever he felt he needed to rewrite from more of like a producer's standpoint, and then we would just go back and forth until we had a, a final a final version. So I would basically get Soup's file, write new drums for it, and then kind of just ask myself like, where am I not as interested in this, you know? Um, and then I would either get rid of parts or repeat parts that were already there. And sometimes I would, you know, add a whole thing with drums and like some bullshit guitar parts and send that to Soup and he would kind of redo it and we would just talk about it a lot. It was just a lot of collaboration between me and Soup. Sometimes my entire role for a revision, like, you know, we would kind of settle on a structure and I would send it to Soup and then he would send it back with like a new guitar part that was going over top of it, almost like overcompensating some, some of the time. Like my entire role for that 
you know, moment would be, hey, I think it is good enough how it is. Sometimes when it's just you working on something, it's really easy to second guess yourself and just keep adding and adding and adding stuff or taking stuff away when something maybe does need to be there. So just having a second opinion like that might not even be, you know, changing the music, but just telling you like, hey, it was good enough before, you know, we don't need to change it from where it is. So, so yeah, that was kind of a lot of it, just a lot of my opinion on what Sue had already written. We don't get like offended or butt hurt or, or, or anything about someone making a suggestion for someone else's part. You know, if, it, if it's cool, if it fits the song better, then we'll keep it. And if it doesn't, then I'll say that. There were some songs where I would come to Soup with, like, well, for a, uh, fuck, can I have the paper? For Whelmed. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> okay. For Whelmed, I wrote like a full structure, or at least for the, for the first half of the song, you know, I was kind of like starting it, you know, and then Sue would rewrite it and like add harmonies and different melodies and whatnot. And him and I would kind of go back and forth and give our opinions um, until we kind of finalized it. And I think that song ended up being really cool, even though it, you could call it kind of random the way it transitions. And I was like, I don't want to just, you know, disregard what's happening and go somewhere else. I want to, you know, have things flow and like keep this vibe going. So sometimes it's worth it to just be like, okay, I don't know where this is going. Let's just <laughs> see what happens if I completely change it up and convincing yourself to try something new. That's really hard. I and think the vocals really tied that song. Like yeah, true. The vocals on the song are the fucking best, dude. Yeah. I will say it was the first time I really wasn't, I didn't really give a fuck what I was gonna play. I was just like, I'm just gonna sing some shit. Yeah. <laughs> and see what happens. Dude, yeah. <laughs> Lyrics, Um, I mean, like, it's kind of like, because when I was looking back, I'm like, dang, like a lot of these, are just like like it's kind of stitched together of stuff that I've written and stuff that Soup has written. So I honestly could like you know you'll see some words I'm in there somewhere <laughs> like a line or two like mixed with his line you know. I would like take like several stanzas of lyrics that you've mm. written and then like mix them with mine <clears> and just like whatever whatever passage of a few words would fit best for a certain line I'll put in there. So it's really hard to pinpoint for certain songs like which lyrics are yours and which lyrics are mine. Yeah. They all just kind of blend it together. For this album, I would pick like individual topics to write about beforehand, which I hadn't really done before. Like for, for previous stuff, JD or I would just uh, like have lyrics that we had just like written randomly like when we had the creative urge to and then just go back and basically like scavenge through older lyrics that we had written and then arrange them into a song worth of lyrics. Whereas for Totem, I would actually like think of a topic to write about and then focus in on that topic and start there for the lyrics. I would uh, get a little inebriated <laughs> and uh, just write shit, I don't know. And like, honestly, like last year, like you can kind of tell that most of the stuff I'm writing has like a depressed tone to it. Given the tone of last year too, it's just like, I don't know. I feel like it definitely shows. Like you, you'll see something and be like, oh, okay, that, that checks out. Day one, here we go. Fuck yeah, third time recording with Corey. Let's fucking do it. Oh my Yo, god. What's what up? up, dude? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it's been a minute. It has been a minute, man. Uh, I am excited to get started finally. Yeah, seriously. I just finished loading all these things in. My role in Seder has pretty much been like the same that it's been for all the records. Yeah, I mean, obviously I do the engineering, like I dial in the drum tones and the guitar tones and, and set up microphones and stuff like that. And, and I do the mixing and the editing and, and just quality control of everything, I guess. Yeah, I mean, typical producer engineer stuff, but I feel like at this point, I, I'm definitely like part of the band and, and that the guys come to me with questions and on my opinions on things before we even start recording. 
pretty much it. Uh, I make things sound good. You you have a very big like producer role. Yeah. Uh, outside of being an, an actual engineer producer, like a like a producer for songwriting. Song yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I just feel like I mean, Seder and me, it, it just makes sense because I listen to this kind of music as well. I feel like I have a good ear for this kind of music. So yeah, like when I hear stuff from this band, like I, I get it and I understand what they're going for. And so I feel like I, it's natural for me to take on a production role to where like I know what things need to be added if they need to be added or what things could be taken away if, if they're not necessary. And uh, yeah, I mean, I just feel like the the relationship that we all share just makes sense for me to have a pretty big part in the sound sonically, but also the production and arrangement and stuff like that. I know. <laughs> oh, so the profiles are working? Yeah, I mean, so, I haven't like plugged a guitar in and tried it out, but okay. yeah, they loaded up, I can... Sick. So like, you sent me a shit ton of presets way back. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah, I had like a stuff. thousand tones that I was just going through and like modifying slightly to find the best ones. It's so much, isn't it? Yeah, it's <laughs> There's crazy. like literal infinite guitar tones on the cover, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, he knows our sound and what we're going for. And we were, we were talking about like newer sound and newer direction for this record as compared to past stuff. But I mean, this is our third album with him. So I think he listened to the whole album of demos that we did like maybe once before we started. So it's not like he really knows the song super well. I guess he just like gets it. He just like gets what we're going for, even if he hasn't heard the songs yet. Yeah, I mean, we we do DI in case we want to reamp anything. So like every part we track, the same take will get tracked twice, basically one DI and then one through the Kemper, uh, just through this DI box. But it's so in case we want to change any tones later, we can just having the direct input take. You know, if we want to use a DSP for a certain part instead of a pepper tone later yeah so like we didn't actually like track with any of the pedals it was all reamped like i would send it out of the interface and then it would go into the pedals and then it would go back into the kemper and then we would record it and um that i mean that's the way to do it honestly because you don't have to worry about playing it perfectly like it's already played perfectly and then it's like an exact double and it's, so it's just like it's almost like putting a plug in on the track that's already there and then doing like a, a, a wet dry knob, you know, like I can set the level based on like the level of the actual like main guitar tone. Like Soup said, he didn't even have his guitar here on the days that we did that. So yeah, it's just all all kind of like an in the box, like signal flow type thing. Um, I mean, aside from the pedals, but yeah. Yeah, here. Fucking sick. Ranch dance. Ranch dance. Ranch dance. Oh my god. Oh fuck. Oh. Dude, I feel great. Okay. Alright. Um, I don't know what happened. My laptop has like PTSD. Well, um, at whatever point, if we could maybe um, go through and just like see if all the measure numbers line up, just yeah. because sometimes, like with the tempo changes or the time signatures, at least when I've sent you my MIDI and stuff, sometimes certain stuff won't import. Yeah, it's everything seems seems to be good, but yeah, we can go. Um, me measure one, three, four. One seventy five, three, four. Then it goes to six, four. Measure two. Yeah, and then the last measure is At, is six, four, and one fifty one. And no tempo changes, I think. Uh, no tempo changes, no. Seder has to be the most prepared band that I work with consistently. Like they just really dialed it all in to where like all I have to do is import a single MIDI file and everything is just right there and then we're good to go. And then 19. Why? What are the what are these number names? <laughs> <laughs> it's the like it's well, the order of songs I wrote. Super wrote like 30 demos and then oh, like we, we picked like nine idea, yeah. nine out of the thirty. Yeah. So, but we just and kept it didn't all the numbers. And start getting good till 12. Yeah. <laughs> From the start, for writing this album, we wanted to take like a little heavier approach um, and a little darker approach sonically. And uh, the best way to do that is just write in a lower key and write in a lower tuning. Drop C stuff allows for us to do like breakdowns and like breakdown adjacent kind of stuff. I remember texting you and I was like, 
we should write and fucking drop C. And you said yes. You you said yes. Praise God. <laughs> 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 like a count off before it bring up. And then slow it down. Dude, we, we need to make like a hidden track. Like like the last song rings out for like two minutes and then at the very end. <laughs> no, it's gotta be longer. It's gotta be like four times longer. <laughs> Seam is about uh, my struggles with procrastination and trying to overcome that. Like, like that song is a, is in a way like about writing this album and like how I felt while writing this album, feeling like I wasn't getting enough done, even though I was writing shit for this fucking album that ended up being on it. Yeah. Uh, With Locus and Neutrino, we did drums first, but this time around, Soup's tracking the bass and the guitar to my program drums, so everything will be on the grid. I've done drums last a couple times, and it can always be a bit weird, but I think just with our process with Corey and the way that Soup likes to track, um, I'm confident that it'll sound great. With, with guitar, you can really, if you wanted to, you could punch in every note and it would sound fine if if whoever's editing it knows what they're doing and whoever's tracking it knows what they're doing. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Did you get that? Yeah. stressing about this bassist thing. I've been stressing about it. Uh, well, uh, Calvin left, uh, he left over a year ago now. He left in January 2020, uh, cause he just didn't want to be a career musician anymore. He wanted to go back to school for computer science and do computer science shit, which is, you know, uh, a much safer <laughs> career choice than this. So I do not blame him at all. So we are bassist less. And uh, I'm tracking the bass for this album, and I've been writing the parts, which has been super fun. But obviously we need a bassist for live shows, and it's going to be hard to find someone because this shit is super difficult to play. So we need to find someone who's like really, really good and down for uh, any tours that we have and all that. That's like fucking trippy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was Brody's idea. <laughs> of course it was. Anything triplet related. Triplet or dotted. <laughs> yeah. It's Brody. Alrighty. Stay tuned in. Does this feel like work? Yeah. Yes and no. Yeah. yeah I agree. There's times where it's like this is a breeze and flying by. And there's times yeah. where it's like this fucking tone needs to be yeah, better, like, yeah. this, these chugs need to be better. Yeah. 
And like, there's times towards the end of the day where it's like, fuck, I'm ready to go home. Yeah, seriously. Like I would feel at the shift of my actual job. Yeah. I suppose this is my actual job. Yeah. <sighs> is that like crazy to you? Yes. <laughs> it's very weird. Especially now that we're signed to a real label. Yeah, seriously. So we're signed to a newer label called Kill Iconic Records, which is started by Donovan Malero, who's the frontman of Hail the Sun. They're like us, they're very niche-minded. They go for quality over quantity, like we do. Um, and so we're just all very like-minded people and we, and we play like-minded music and we have similar perspectives and approach approaches to marketing and content. And they just, they kind of gave us like a stupid good deal that we like couldn't turn down more or less. Uh, and obviously they're dudes that we've been inspired by and been listening to for years now. Uh, so yeah, it, it just made sense. I feel like in everything I do, I take uh, by default like a maximalist approach. And so when I go through and I'll, I'll start by writing one like rhythm guitar part for an entire song and just go all the way through before I touch any other parts or bass or anything. Then I'll go back and always write a second guitar part because there's two guitars. So there has to be at least two parts for basically everything. And then if I just hear something in my head or I'm jamming over the two parts I already have and I think it sounds good then I'll just put it in and there would always be like a second or third guitar part that I think another harmony on top like a third above could work and then I'll just like keep stacking parts especially for like very climactic parts uh, I'll just work it out to it'll be like one rhythm part and then two lead parts and both lead parts will have a harmony and I just I just like to put a lot of shit into into the biggest parts of songs. When you do three records with a band, like you, you you start to really dial in the the flow and the way things just kind of happen efficiently. And so yeah, I feel like we're we're at the point where like we could make a record no matter what the conditions at wherever we need to be, just because we know how each other works and we know the best ways to do things now with like them as individual performers as well as the band as a whole. It'll be <laughs> It'll be accent, palm mute, palm mute, accent, accent, palm mute, accent, palm mute. <laughs> so how is that sound? Dad, dude, dad, dad, dude, dad, dude. <laughs> okay, cool. So dad, dude, dude, dad, dad, dude, dad, dude. Yes. All right. <laughs> that actually took a lot of, of mental energy to do that properly. Butter doody doody do. I don't even remember what it was. Butter doody doody do. Butter doody doody do. And then what happens? And then the next measure is dad do dad do. So dad do do dad dad do dad do dad do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gold. <laughs> What are we up to right now? Uh, we're figuring out what bass strings will work best for this dingwall that we're borrowing from our friend Ryan. We found a new live bassist. His name is Ryan Jones, and he's he's a super sick bassist, and he's a dedicated bassist. He doesn't even play guitar, which is kind of what we were looking for, someone who's like just a bassist. We had met him, we danced with him once or twice, and he has a dingwall, which is like the best recording bass for rock and metal. It was like maybe a week before we were set to track bass that he offered to let us borrow it. Um, and the dingwall bass is just a very particular, unique instrument, uh, and that led to us making a lot of assumptions on what strings to use that were incorrect as far as like scale length and string gauge. Yeah, I mean, guitar tracking was very efficient, I think. We did it in uh, 18 days of tracking over like a month. It's going good. This is the biggest problem so far. <laughs> so on, on the fourth? Okay. Dude, uh, I just, I feel like we're, I feel like this might set us back a little bit. Like, like a few weeks, honestly. A few weeks? Cause like, I don't know if these are gonna be what we need, but I wanna try these and I wanna try the other ones. So we might just need to get a pack of like, 
all the options and try them all out. And then once we figure out which one works, order the order them all. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Because base is important. Yeah. It's always something. Yeah. Damn, well... Damn, dude. Alright, well, I mean, I guess I'm going to order these all from Denario. Yeah, so, I mean, we're just going to have to wait. We have no choice. <laughs> What? I said fuck. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, if we got to postpone bass uh, for this, which is fine, um, yeah. we can do drums and guitar effects earlier. Oh, yeah, true. We're having more, like, sequence breaks, like, palette cleanser kind of things on this album. We'll have a few short, like, 10-second interludes, like, little electronic bits. Oh, that's, that's some shit we can do while waiting for bass strings as well, actually. Work, stuff. work on the interludes. Yeah. yeah, there's like a minute and a half long interlude kind of track. That's like clean electric guitar. But that's instrumental. Um, but it, it's, it's really like a glorified intro to another song. Like it'll, there will be like a swell at the end going into it. We did some interludes. There was, there's one interlude after um, Dogma where I took a, a measure of that Guitar Pro demo and just took out the MIDI and like looped it and we made like a whole interlude out of that. The way that it came about was kind of interesting. So I was mixing a demo for this song as of right now it's called New Song 20. I was looping a part because I was mixing it and I wanted to see how it would sound and uh, I just like really liked how it sounded. So it sounds pretty weird but I, I really liked like the repeating melody. That's where the idea started, and, and so I just like saved that as a file because I wanted to come back to it, and then we started talking about interludes. So I found that file, and then I found what measure number that was in Guitar Pro so I could get the MIDI. So here's that same thing in Guitar Pro. And so I imported it into this whole new session, and I made like a full like minute-ish interlude. Um, just with that one measure. So Soup wrote the melody, I guess, but I figured, hey, I'll just take this and like kind of reinterpret it. Here's a guitar part. And then, you know, you got like the MIDI that I took from Guitar Pro. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I guess I'll just let it play a little bit. I added some ocean sound effects for added uh, emotion. We've never had any kind of like electronic aspect of our music really at all. Um, but on this album, we're messing around with it. On all the other releases, it's all just, you know, song, song, song. But this time we really <laughs> kind of made an effort um, talking to each other and we were like, it might be cool if we had, you know, kind of palate cleansers in between certain songs. Sometimes it can be really hard to, you know, look at the uh, list of songs and be like, okay, what comes after this? You know, because I love this song, I love this song, but they're totally different. They really don't flow together, but when you move one song in the order around, it messes up everything. So being able to insert a palate cleanser interlude kind of thing, especially a longer one like this, um, it really kind of gives you room to, uh, you know, go anywhere with the album order. <clears throat> can't can't track anything else because we're we're waiting on a bunch of shit to happen for the other three instruments. So we're doing stuff we would have done last. Uh, now, got to wait for bass strings to get here for the ding wall. Got to wait to book a drum room for drums, and got to wait for a new mic to get here for vocals. Do key stuff. That's what we're doing. Yeah, pay attention to him. He's doing key stuff. Brody technically doesn't even need to be here. <clears throat> well, I wrote a fucking entire interlude. So, uh, <laughs> well, I guess you kind of wrote it, but I orchestrated it. Yeah, and I did the exact same thing for the new riff interlude. You wrote it and I arranged really it. really complement each other. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Okay. I 
feel like once it once it gets to this outro part, like j really just on that last chord, because it holds out, it could be on the twenty two strings. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Twenty two strings. Twenty two strings. Can we do that? <laughs> Wanna write, two, let's write a trap next day. Twenty two strings. Twenty two strings. Ha! Huh? Twenty two strings. Twenty two. Twenty two strings. <laughs> This is like exactly what I had in mind anyway. My my only thing is I feel like it needs some something else. I feel, I feel like, like it needs could, like a drone pad. Yeah, or something. I was kind of thinking there could be like some weird like ambient. Yeah. Like, mm, yeah. Okay. Okay. So another thing that we did this time was we didn't track the drums here at Corey's studio. We went to May's Studios in Atlanta. I thought, like, why do the same drum room for three records in a row, you know? Dude, everything's fucking weird. Going to a studio that has, like, uh, like literally hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gear to play around with was just, it was really fun. Um, I got to kind of get the sounds that like most people like strive for when they step into like a big studio. And they've got a bunch of microphones and 48 inputs, which I only have like 15 inputs at my place. So this is <laughs> quite a lot more than we're, we're used to having. So yeah, it's, it's fun getting to mess around with all the stuff here. We're using this cool copper DW snare. We, I brought my Tama uh, bronze snare which we did sample, so I'm not using all my own stuff, but for the most part, it's still my kit. We mess around with lots of different cymbals. Yeah, I guess we didn't really do that with Locust. I mean, the place that we're at right now has, uh, has a snare drum that was really nice that we ended up using. And then we are using the studio's crash cymbals as well. Um, we played around with like seven different combinations we of crashes. Of yeah, we, we did a lot of different combinations of crashes and then just kind of like A-beat them all back to back and decided which ones sounded the most appropriate for the songs. heavy into my drums this time. On Locus, I improvised a lot. Physically, I just kind of figured it out, you know, naturally, which probably sounds pretty normal to most drummers, but what I've been doing for the past maybe two-ish years, I program my parts, like, very meticulously. Every single note I will program. That really allows me to come up with some pretty um, intricate parts that I wouldn't come up with on the kit. And you know, there's something to be said for either way. Like you can come up with like crazy awesome parts by programming, but you can also come up with parts that are really memorable and relatable by just sitting down and playing. For stuff like this where it's, you know, extremely through composed music, I do feel like it benefits it a lot, you know, to, um, you know, really take the time programming every note for a lot of it and asking yourself like, is this like the best possible fill that could fit this part? You know, and also making sure that everyone else in the band is cool with it. On top of things being, you know, physically difficult because they're just fucked up um, technically, it was also just really tough to memorize everything. For all the songs, I like started learning them at a way slower tempo 
and then, you know, memorize the whole thing and then would gradually speed up until I had a full speed. And that's something that I've kind of, you know, second guessed about my writing for drums has been just how much I don't repeat things. You know, like I'll copy paste my drums, but then I'll go back through and kind of like change some stuff. It would be as simple as like one ghost note. I would be like, okay, this time I'm not gonna play that ghost note on this repetition because I played it earlier just so it feels live, which it is. It just gives some variety, even if you only subconsciously hear it, you know? So memorizing that kind of stuff and being disciplined, like I'm gonna memorize this part this way. And then when this part comes back, I'm gonna memorize it the way I programmed it and play it note for note, you know? Um, that was very difficult to do, but I did it. The drum comping for this one was like <laughs> the most intense thing ever. It, we were really just looking for for flams, like or that's like real inconsistent. Hits yeah, like yeah, hits. yeah. Anything that was like like maybe like a cymbal hit like wasn't as as powerful as it needed to be, or a snare hit wasn't as hard as it needed to be, or like a weak kick hit or something. But it was mostly flams that we were looking for. <laughs> Flam. <laughs> I'm just thinking about cum, cum. And flams. And flams. <laughs> so like, there would be times where we're, like, you know, we did like five takes of every song, or like four or five takes of every song. And so we would be listening to each take and it's the same exact thing. Like, so we're just like going mad, like listening to the same exact things. And you trick yourself into thinking that it sounds bad. And so, yeah, like there'll be moments where we, I would play a part and then we'd be like, oh, that one wasn't as good. And then we'd get like sidetracked for five minutes and then I'd play the same part and then Brody would be like, yeah, that one. That was all good enough for me. I don't know. <laughs> that was probably like the most in-depth um, drum recording I've ever done. On top of just going to a nice studio, it was sick doing it with Corey who engineered everything obviously. And we, you know, got to really like nerd out on the drums and use a ton of mics, like the most mics I had ever used. We close mic'd everything. So that was just really cool. Like doing it for, you know, it wasn't a session, it's my band and being able to like be really emotionally invested in it and like be confident, like we're gonna get the sickest drum sound we've gotten yet. And feeling that I was really prepared on the songs and all of that combined was just a really nice experience. Like, you know, having the budget to go somewhere sick having the know-how to put it all together to sound great and having the, you know, preparation that I had done, practicing everything. Vocals day one, Do, doing some screams. Starting off great, didn't have headphones, so. Gotta go to Ken Stanton and buy new headphones. headphones. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good, I'm feeling prepared. I'm definitely way more prepared than the last couple records. Um, I've actually been practicing in the few days leading up to this. <laughs> Now, sliding our sound. Uh some screamies. Most important instrument, or half of it, I guess, you know? It's what everyone pays attention to, you know? Even even in this very niche genre of only musicians for fans that we have. Brody and I would go through each song and pick individual sections that we wanted screams to be, like, you know, from one minute to 120, we want screams here, and just do that for every song. And then I would go in and write out gibberish rhythms uh, to those parts, like da 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 da, da and <laughs> like literally do that into a mic. Uh, and then I would actually tab it out in Guitar Pro on a piano track, just pick a random note and then tab out the rhythm. So we would get the whole rhythm down and then I would go back and write lyrics and then put lyrics to those rhythms. And then uh, I would send it to Brody and JD and then we would do the usual like revision process. I took a lot more time to prepare 
for this one. Uh, like, I remember the first day of Scream recording for Locust, I like hadn't practiced vocals at all for like maybe two months prior to that. And so day one, my voice was like immediately shot because I'd like lost the technique. And so it took a second to get it back. So I just uh, was a lot more serious about being more prepared, practicing every day for like a month leading up to Scream tracking. Yeah, this is the last line of Screams. It didn't take very long, no. all in all. Screams really wear me out. And Scream days are usually shorter, just cause it's very physically taxing. Uh, and my throat would never give out, but like I would start getting piercing headaches after like four or five hours and just have to stop. Like I would feel like very lightheaded and like I'm gonna pass out. So uh, Scream days are like half as long as any uh, other normal day. Okay. <laughs> Let's change the bass strings, I guess. <laughs> we have other shit to do. All right, time to switch gears. string debacle turn out to be worth it? I mean, it will be, yeah, yeah because we're so. gonna get to use the dingwall on yeah. the whole album after uh, a couple days of yeah. dealing with bullshit. <laughs> but thanks, Ryan, for letting us use your dingwall for so long. It'll be worth it. I just thought it would be a cool experience to write and record bass for an album, which I had never done before. And I'm trying to uh, like branch out into into more session work. It was a perfect opportunity given that we didn't have a full-time bassist. And because I wrote all the guitar parts, it was just easier for me to write the bass too. Uh, Cause I, like while writing guitar, I already had an idea like loosely of what the bass would be. So it was just easier for me to just write it out and then Brody and I to go back and forth on it. And since Soup and I already have, a, in my opinion, a pretty good dynamic writing together um, and we collaborate really well, we are just like-minded in that way that we'd be like, why wouldn't we make the bass lock in with the drums right there, you know? And it was really sick and just really collaborative and yeah, just easy to make everything totally in sync. I know I sat with a lot of the songs for like maybe, if not days, like a few weeks. Cause this is the only thing I'm working on with the album. So I just wanted it to be like strong. Like I didn't want it to be like, ah, eh, kind of lackluster. Like, okay, this is a vocal line. There you go. So I would hear Soup's demo. And most of the stuff I did was like a, a strong harmony, I'd like to say of just what he was doing, but like kind of embellishing on some parts. Like the intro to Bloom, like, sounded completely different like because i just come in kind of like <laughs> but, <laughs> but like the old one it was just like but i was like oh yeah no nah. like i was just well, like you would, like completely rewrite yeah the like like the attrition stuff the yeah like a yeah, lot of like that was like totally new <laughs> There's a lot more like soulful, like almost, almost R&B Yeah, vocals. yeah, cause that's, I mean, that's really what I grew up with too. Like y'all grew up on Rush, I grew up on like Stevie Wonder. And so that's when I started like fucking with the harmonies and shit and just being like, uh, like once I would sing one line, like kind of what you did with the guitar parts, I would be like, you would do one thing and it's like, 
this needs something else. Let me just throw it in there. And it's like, oh, it needs something else. Yeah, I, lo I loved with all your demos, you would like layer the fuck out of your mm -hmm. vocals. It wouldn't just be one line. Like you would write two or three or four harmonies for like yeah. the entire thing. Yeah, that's that's definitely new. Like I usually don't mess with harmonies until I'm here or something. But yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're still like going through and tweaking certain stuff and making changes to final melodies and like trying out stuff on the spot. And this time we're doing all harmonies like at the same time as the lead vocals, whereas like the last couple records, like JD would lay down all the, all the lead stuff and then I would come in on like separate days and do layered harmonies and stuff. But now we're just combining it all into, into one process. I feel like it's more efficient this way too. Yeah. And like we're tweaking stuff with harmonies too the same way, just like using auto tune to find out where the best notes may lie for certain chords and whatever. Because I just sang the exact same yeah. thing that Dad is doing. Just in a higher. That <laughs> was like a choir. Just <laughs> we all picked different harmonies there. That's a little too like choir. -y. Christmas Carol. Yeah. Complicate removal of my sins. It's <laughs> <laughs> like so fucking Christmas Carol. -y. <laughs> Mind that silence never offers it. planned on having you do a lot of the harmonies but mm. then that was but just, then yeah a lot of the vocal main melodies were so high anyways that it was just like we were reaching the top of your register and like soup has a higher register but like less control mm. and so soup would still have to do the those higher super high harmonies but right. yeah but every every spot that we could fit you to do a harmony we had you do a harmony. And at least two or three notes that are the highest note that you're mm. physically capable of hitting on. For record. sure. And the longest I've probably sustained, yeah, like, in a one, like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, my lungs are, uh, <laughs> they're crying. <laughs> <laughs> they're crashing through the wire, procreating sounds inspired. Uh, one more time. I think it's expired. Expired? Yeah, I think so. I'm sorry, my reaction to that was like... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Expired? <laughs> my whole life? <laughs> Son of a bitch. Okay. What do you mean adopted? <laughs> my progression through the wire Procreating sounds in... Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry. Procreating sounds in... X. X. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay. You just have like a unique perspective on it. Your notes on clean shit would be weird. Yeah. It would, it would just be like, you should like do something else. <laughs> like, like, that would be your note for, for a part. Yeah, or like sometimes I'd be like, the singing wasn't quite locked in to, you know, what the instrumental was doing. And like that's not always, you know, crucial. But sometimes I feel like it is important to like kind of hit some of those uh, stabs, you know, in the rhythm. 
our bodies are, are literally programmed to feel things from vocals because, you know, that's how we survive, by communication with other human beings. So I feel like the vocals are the most important thing on a record that has vocals. It needs to be super relatable, like the, the melodies need to have a lot of like space and room to breathe and they need to be really catchy. They need to have like climax and resolution and, and like things that, that pull you and push you and, and throw you into the next section. And I feel like a lot of the changes that I made were specifically with those intentions in mind. I was pretty stoked that, <laughs> that I got to have such a big part in it because like obviously you guys can't tell I fucking love this band and I care a lot about this band. Being able to have such a, a, a huge role in stuff like that where it's not just me dialing in sounds and making stuff sound cool. It's like I actually like I've actually put myself creatively into this record specifically. And, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. The vocals were pretty evenly split, like four ways between yeah. all of us giving large amounts of input. Yeah, it, it's really cool how that all came together. Definitely by far the most collaborative part of this album. Yeah, the only song that's named after a lyric is 22. Which is? Mm. Bloom. Oh, okay. Yeah, the part where you're like, Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> no, whoa, no. yes! Yeah. We, Wait. we had like an, an entire day that was specifically just like, yeah, we got to get that one note. Yeah, yeah. I'll never forget like, re I had to like come back track. to that. Yeah, yeah, but damn, that was. When you mm. fucking blow out your yeah. upper register for that shit. Yeah, <laughs> near, yeah. I mean. playing our first show in 18 months with uh, Hail the Sun and Kurt Travis and Kei Onashi and Body Thief. Like most of the people involved with Kill Iconic Records. We're playing six songs off Locust and then one new song, we're playing Dogma. Just under a lot of pressure right now. I got all these cables and shit. Okay. Like I don't know which one's what. And then Ryan, it's Ryan's first show with us. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's true. Debuting a new live member. Practicing alone is fine, but I don't know. It's something about getting together and yeah. like doing it that I, I don't know. I get more confidence. First time, there's definitely like a little adrenaline rush, kind of mm. like especially the first time playing a new song. Like you just start like kind of laughing while you're playing it because it's mm. so sick. Um. <laughs> 